following interview was conducted with uh, Professor H. W. Thien, Professor Rolf. Emeritus Paul, Paul, uh, Rolf H. W. Rolf. Thien, sorry, um, Professor Emeritus of Political Science for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, November 24th, 2008 in Stewart Center. Welcome. Nice Thank to you. have you. And tell us a little bit about where you were born and mm -hmm. siblings in early years. Well, I was born in uh, Germany in 1937 and uh, uh, <coughs> have two sisters. One is a year and a half older than I am and the other one is 13 years younger than I am. So I am the proverbial middle child. And uh, uh, sometimes I hear from our children that uh, that's what your problem is. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, they do pick up on things like that sometimes. Yeah, they do. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I attended uh, uh, what in German is called the Volksschule, which is like elementary school uh, in uh, Germany for four years. And then in the fourth grade, I uh, <coughs> had to take a series of examinations. And after I passed those exams, I went into a special track that leads to certification for uh, university uh, level education. And uh, so that's where I went into foreign languages, beginning with Lat Latin and then uh, English and then French. Uh, and uh, <coughs> in uh, 1953, uh, I was an exchange student in Germany, uh, in German, chosen from, uh, from German students for a program that the High Commission of Germany after the war uh, ran, the idea being that uh, uh, they wanted to bring lots of young Germans to the United States so they could see how life functioned here, learn about democracy, come back and educate uh, the older generation and the younger generation. And so I spent a year uh, on a dairy farm uh, with uh, a family. They were members of the Church of the Brethren, which uh, actually is a church that originated in Germany uh, <coughs> and uh, just recently celebrated its 300th anniversary. Uh, it no longer exists in Germany, but uh, it exists in the United States and especially in Africa and some other places. Uh, it's one of the historic peace churches, uh, along with the Quakers and the Mennonites. Uh, anyway, uh, I spent the year in the United States and uh, uh, was taken by the pastor of the church that my foster parents here and I attended to uh, uh, Manchester College and also to uh, uh, Wittenberg College in Springfield, Ohio. And, uh, <coughs> I returned to Germany with the exchange group, which in that year was uh, 611 students from Germany, and uh, uh, went back to school and then became a banking apprentice for a short time, then decided I really wanted to uh, get an advanced education. In those days, my parents were not in a position to finance uh, such an education because they had lost everything in the war, but I knew that I could make it on my own in the United States and uh, so I came back and went to Manchester and uh, at Manchester uh, I uh, majored in political science history and uh, economics as a triple major and I did that program in three years to save myself some money and uh, when I was uh, uh, a senior uh, at Manchester I uh, saw my wife I picked her out of a cafeteria line at Manchester and uh, our, was sort of a case of I came, I saw, and she conquered. So <laughs> we got married and uh, I've really been a uh, permanent resident of the United States uh, since then and became a citizen in 1962. Can I back up? Uh, what was, where were you living during the war? Was, were you going to school also during the war in Germany? Uh, oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. School continued on, in other words. Yeah, places. school went on. Mm -hmm. uh, was this what city was this? Uh, this was, uh, well, uh, first, uh, the elementary school was in a little village called Elverdissen, which is near a larger city called Herford. And Herford is uh, really quite an old uh, city, it has a long, long history, uh, some very interesting old buildings, especially churches, and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, the, uh, the secondary level school, the gymnasium, as the Germans call it, uh, was in Herford. And uh, so I would, you know, every school day uh, on my bicycle drive, uh, you know, uh, ride to uh, 
halfway, and when the weather was really bad, then uh, we took the bus. Uh, and uh, <coughs> one of the interesting things about it was that uh, uh, these, were, of course, were the post-war years, and uh, we had, among other things, we had 13 different subjects in the gymnasium, including three languages, and uh, uh, one of which was uh, German history. And uh, German history always ended with the First World War. We never made it into the Nazi period. Uh, that came after I had long left Germany. I mean, finally now uh, the Germans uh, teach their children the what happened during the Nazi period. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, and then from Manchester College, mm -hmm. uh, I went to Indiana University. I was first a teaching assistant, and then I lucked out and uh, uh, received a uh, university-wide uh, fellowship. And then the following year, uh, what was then the best possible uh, grant you could get, and that was uh, Ford Foundation uh, Fellowship. And uh, that fellowship saw me through the rest of my graduate school. I finished with a PhD in 1964. Uh, had my major in political science, but also did a, an area certificate on Russia and the uh, Soviet Union with the Russian East European Institute at IU. So uh, uh, in 1964, uh, <coughs> well, first of all, I was here, my wife and I got married in 1959. In 1964, we moved to. Uh, uh, in 1959, we moved to Indiana University for graduate study, and in 1964, I finished with a PhD, and my first academic appointment was uh, Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa. And I was there until, uh, for seven years until 1971, and then I received an invitation to come to IU, and uh, was interviewed, and decided for a variety of reasons uh, to leave Ames really liked Iowa State University, but uh, Purdue was closer to the Indiana University Library that I'd worked in for my PhD, and uh, Ames, Iowa was somewhat remote. Uh, the library was not as good as IU, and uh, uh, between Purdue and IU, I really had uh, good library facilities for my research. Also did quite a bit of work at uh, University of Illinois in Champaign, Urbana. Uh, <coughs> As far as teaching is concerned, when did you come to Purdue? To Purdue, Purdue in 1971. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Tell us a little about what it was like in political science. Uh, well, Purdue, like uh, uh, Iowa State, was of course a land grant uh, college initially, and then university, and uh, uh, they had a joint department of history, political science, and philosophy. And just about the time I came. That was resolved, and they had uh, brought a new chairman for uh, what, what then became a political science department separate from uh, philosophy and, and from history, which had their own programs then. And uh, uh, I, uh, I came here and as an associate professor, and uh, I, was I was working on a book on Lenin, a uh, political biography of Lenin, uh, which I finished in 1973, and in 73 then I was promoted to a uh, full professor, and I held that, that uh, title until I retired in 2003. <coughs> did you tell some of the courses, and uh, did you start to continue your research there? Uh, <coughs> yeah. Uh, my initial research focused on uh, 19th century Russian political thought, uh, which also meant uh, reading a lot of literature. And uh, it wasn't until uh, Gorbachev came along in the Soviet Union that I switched from that focus to contemporary uh, Soviet domestic and foreign policy. And uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, I taught uh, pretty much the same courses in, uh, in both universities, Iowa State and, and uh, uh, Purdue, comparative politics, uh, especially Soviet political and uh, systems and uh, uh, communist political systems, uh, Russian political thought, 19th and 20th century, Soviet foreign policy, Marxism and Leninism, politics in Germany, China, and Japan, 
an introduction to the study of political science. I taught lots of seminars on special topics, but that would be a very long list. So, so anyway, uh, uh, <coughs> and then I co-authored a book uh, with a colleague of mine who uh, uh, also came from Iowa State. In fact, when I was here, Myron Hale, who was then the chair of political science, asked me who else is good at Iowa State, and I said, well, if I were you, I would go after Lee Wilson. And he said, well, who is Lee Wilson? I said, well, he just came to Iowa State from uh, UCLA. He's a brilliant political scientist. And uh, uh, I said, you really need a Europeanist. And uh, Lee Wilson especially was French politics and European politics. So uh, the same year that I started at Purdue, uh, Lee Wilson started as well. He joined me here. Okay. So, uh, well, that worked out nice. Yeah, that worked out. Mm -hmm. Were there any faculty committees that you were on and when you came? And uh, the department must have grown. Then it, when it became separate, you might make a comment how then the department started to grow. Well, yes. Uh -huh. uh, it grew quite a bit. And uh, uh, we had a dean at that time uh, who was very helpful with necessary funds, supported the new program, and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. that all worked very well. Uh, well, there were various kinds of committees within the department. And from you know time to time, uh, I served on different ones. The, the two committees that, uh, well, the two responsibilities uh, in the department that I had was uh, uh, director of graduate studies for four or five years, which was the longest anybody had ever lasted in that position for some reason. <laughs> and uh, uh, <coughs> then I served on the grievance committee in the school, uh, and I was elected, I don't know why, but year after year, I was elected to the uh, Area Committee of the School of Liberal Arts, which was, of course, not called that when I first came. But anyway, uh, so I served in that committee for many, many years and uh, uh, had some other responsibilities, but again. Uh, the school, had, at the, when you came, was uh, Hissy had been split? Was it, uh, or was it when you first came, that it was Manny Social Science and Education? Uh, no, it was Hissy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. then it then it split after it yeah. came. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. For the research, it's now liberal arts and education. Right. 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 Okay. Now let's move. Tell us a little bit about your sabbatical, some of the work and things in the. Well, the I was I was very fortunate in, uh, and this really began in uh, graduate school, uh, in getting outside funding, uh, and uh, I, as I look back, uh, it was just almost like a dream. I mean, I had. I had 26 cents to my name when I hit New York coming back from Germany to go to, uh, yeah. to, uh, to college here. And I had a bus ticket for my uh, uh, foster parents in Ohio. And I was lucky enough to find somebody in the turmoil of getting off the, uh, the boat oh, and wow. finding someone who would actually drive me to the uh, uh, bus station so I could make use of my ticket. That's great. That's so anyway, got to be the outstanding event in your well, life. Well, <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I worked on the farm that my foster parents uh, uh, had in uh, near Springfield, Ohio. And then uh, in the fall, I started at Manchester College. And uh, I had three jobs. Uh, I washed Was there any financial aid? Was that available uh, at that I time? Had a, yeah, I oh. had a... Uh, uh, an, an honor scholarship, which was a hundred uh, hundred uh, dollars, uh, and uh, I had that all three years I was there. And then I worked in the college kitchen. I washed pots and pans, and then I had a a, a job with uh, the college uh, cleaning out now was janitorial work, uh, doing the offices of the president and the, uh, and the uh, other high level. Christopher Manchin, I forgot <laughs> the entire The administrators, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and, and that job paid 65 cents the first year, an hour, and 75 the second, and 85 the third year. Uh, that was, of course, you know, the, 19, uh, <laughs> the 1950s. Uh, and then I had a job with uh, uh, a company in uh, North Manchester, uh, really like a where they had all kinds of, uh, uh, that was a lumberyard really, with all kinds of other things as well. So I worked there and I made a dollar and a quarter an hour. 
which was moving up, see? Yeah, that's right. Finances are getting better. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, that's how I financed my, my college education. And Very so good. when I left, I didn't have any debts, and uh, that was good. Uh, and then uh, at IU, I first began, I, I first started majoring in economics, and I had a, a teaching assistantship. The second year, I landed a, uh, a university fellowship, which allowed me to work anywhere in the university, and I had no teaching or assistantship obligations. And then the third year uh, is when I really uh, was very, very fortunate in getting a, a grant from the Ford Foundation. And that grant was renewed every year after an interview and evaluation of what we had done the previous years. Ago. And, and it was a very, very generous grant. And thanks to that grant, I was able to go to Europe and work in many countries, uh, British Museum in uh, uh, London, the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, uh, all kinds of archives and, uh, in uh, Switzerland, and also I worked in the uh, library uh, of the University of uh, Geneva, uh, which was the only university that had not been affected by World War II in terms of bombing, so they had materials there that were very, very uh, precious and helped me a great deal my dissertation. My dissertation dealt with, uh, uh, it was a political biography of uh, a Russian revolutionary who had become, uh, he was a journalist, uh, was in trouble for various reasons with uh, the powers that be in South Russia and he then emigrated, as did a lot of other Russians. Uh, Europe, and he lived for the most part in Switzerland because uh, that was where a lot of Russian immigrants had uh, congregated. Uh, there were other places, Paris, and uh, also uh, uh, London had quite a few Russian immigrants. Anyway, uh, uh, to put his uh, life together uh, turned out to be quite difficult because the, the prime scholar in the uh, Soviet Union, a historian, Cosmin, who had written uh, on his life and uh, had published six volumes of uh, this man's writings, mostly uh, articles that were uh, written for uh, journals in South Russia, which he put together into books. Well, in the early 1930s, uh, uh, there was an organization in Russia that tried to uh, uh, it's okay. that tried to. Uh, uh, keep the memory of uh, Russians who had, in the 19th century, written on various social problems and so on, and political problems and so forth. And uh, Stalin decided that uh, that group had to go, so that organization was dissolved, and all their publications uh, were ordered destroyed. So uh, uh, to find the writings of uh, uh, Pyotr Kachov who was the revolutionary that I wrote on, uh, proved to be quite difficult uh, because no library had a complete collection, at least not anywhere in the uh, Western world. Uh, I worked with a uh, bibliophile and uh, a book, uh, uh, well, book in this, the Russian would say, uh, in, in uh, uh, actually had a bookstore uh, in New York, and I worked with him, and uh, he called me one day and he said, uh, uh, no, uh, he called the librarian here at, at IU, and uh, the librarian at IU knew him very well, and he also knew what I was interested in, and he said, uh, we have just received uh, a collection of the six volumes of Kachov's writings. And so I got on the phone right away and uh, called him and said, I'm sorry, but Harvard University just beat you to the punch. <laughs> so they had bought the six volumes. Well, at uh, least they were available. Yeah, right. they were available. Sure. Uh, but of course, uh, it's a kind of thing where you know you would either have to go to Harvard or else know somebody to get that kind of rare volume out of Harvard University you know, uh, Library. But anyway, uh, in uh, the course of my research in uh, uh, in Russia, uh, which happened before I completed my uh, dissertation. I found a lot of materials, I made some good connections, and uh, then later on uh, I had another grant, uh, faculty exchange, which came after Khrushchev came to power and loosened 
the whole relation between the United States and, uh, and Russia, we all of a sudden had uh, a scholar ex exchange at various levels, young faculty and uh, you know, uh, full professors and so on and so forth. So uh, my wife and I went to uh, the Soviet Union for a year with a grant, uh, and uh, uh, I made some very good connections with people who were, uh, like myself, were bibliophiles and uh, who had good connections to uh, the book world in Moscow, which as an American, I, in 62 I became an American. Uh, I could not have because I was not a citizen, I was not a member of the Soviet Writers' Union, uh, so there were, uh, there were bookstores in Moscow that I could not legally enter. But some friends of mine had those connections, and I had a long list, 280-some titles of books that I wanted to find. And I found a, a, a young woman who worked in, a, in an antiquariat in Moscow, and I explained to her what I was doing, and for some reason, I never understand you know, why this worked out the way it did. But s somehow, and she told me, at one point I asked her, I said, why are you doing all this for me? And she would not take anything. I couldn't give any gift, nothing. And, uh, and She was so, Russian? Yeah, she was Russian. And she said, I know from what you have told me, I know what kind of person you are, I know that you will take good care of these books. He said, I am afraid to let these books go out, but at the same time, working here, if somebody comes and they want to pay what they cost, I have to let them go. So what she did was, she had my list, and uh, uh, she would save all the volumes that were on that list as they came in, and most of them. This is in a bookstore, though. This is in a bookstore in Moscow. And uh, and she would you know save these books and uh, she would come and she would say I could tell whether they were books or not just by the way she looked at me when I came in, and uh, and then she would reach under the counter and she had a stack of books. Usually those books came after it was a big holiday because what Russians did is uh, if they didn't have enough money to really f uh, celebrate and so a lot of them would actually look around what would they sell, so they sold old books. And, and uh, of course, it was kind of, you know, at least during the Stalin period, uh, it would have been difficult to do that without running an or, you know, extraordinary risk. Anyway, so uh, make a long story short, uh, uh, she found for me most of the books. Uh, so back, like, they're selling the books, and that's how she's getting them in the bookstore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one time, uh, I was in that bookstore, could you, could you go to the bookstore, though? Yeah, I could get into that. That was, you know, it was a bookstore that was open to anybody. Uh, but there, was, there were other bookstores uh, where you had to be a member of the Writers' Union. You had a, and that's you know, a Soviet. Yeah, a Soviet uh, organization. Uh, organization. Uh, you couldn't publish anything in the Soviet Union without being a, a member of the Writers' Union, if you were, like, a scholar. or uh, Anyway, uh, so... She helped me a great deal, and uh, uh, what a great source! Yes, and then I had made the acquaintance of a young man uh, whom I met at the university, and he was connected to the book world in Moscow, and he helped me a great deal. Uh, I can go through my library now, and I can pull out volumes, and you know I have like you know, lots and lots of books. I don't know how many, <laughs> how many books there are, but I can almost tell you even today where I got that book, whom I owe it to, who found it for me, and so you on. Do so remember and that. there were some whole sets, like, you know, collections of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and so forth. Are, any most, are most of them in Russian, the text, the, te the books that you were Yes, they were all in Russian. All in Russian. Yeah, okay. all in Russian. Okay. Uh, although there were actually a few that had... Uh, some French, there's some French material and some German, but most of them, yeah, Russian. What was the condition of the books overall? Pretty good? Uh, no. Oh. Uh, most of them were in pretty good shape. But in the early 1920s, when there were some publications that uh, were of great value, interest to me, for example, Alexander Herzen's uh, 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 works, they were, they, were t uh, they were produced on paper that did not have a long life. And so I had all those rebound, and they're still, you know, fairly brittle. Uh, compared to, uh, for example, 19th century, books that were published in the 19th century and before the Soviets came to power, the paper is perfectly, 
you know, in good shape and so on. Uh, so yeah, that was something I had to learn. Uh, but uh, uh, this other person who helped me a great deal, uh, and, and I cannot really reveal any names and so on, but anyway, he uh, invited me to his apartment where I'd been many times and uh, where we never sat on chairs because he had uh, staples of books all over the apartment. It wasn't a very large apartment, but lot, I mean, you could have to kind of find your way through this uh, maze. Uh, maze of books. And then we sat on those piles of books because the chairs had other piles on top of them. So <laughs> anyway, he called me and said, well, if he said, uh, uh, I want you to come to my apartment uh, tomorrow. I said, I said, uh, I almost said his name now, uh, I can't really do this because, you know, Norman and I are leaving. You know, we already said goodbye. He said, well, you must come one more time. So I went over there, and uh, uh, he bought a package. He said, this is your going away present. And I said, uh, I said, you already gave me, uh, you know, going away present. And I left one for him, which was a, 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 a small refrigerator, like students have at Peru. Yes which uh, Russians could not get unless they were, you know, had special connection and so on, and for which we had to pay dollars, you know, it was hot currency, but we had a, you know, refrigerator. Anyway. When you, for your apartment. Yeah, yeah okay. mm -hmm. at the university. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, he, uh, he said, well, open it. And so I, you know, opened it. Here were the six volumes of Kachov's writings. Uh, still in the dust cover. I mean, it was, you know, it's, and the problem was, that I could not really legally export those books because uh, uh, they fell under uh, regulations that had come into being that they would not have allowed me to, to take those out. And we, we were able to get books out through the American Embassy. Uh, I was going to ask you. Yeah, you we, had, uh, uh, we had, it was somewhat limited books. We could send so many books per month. Sure. In the Over diplomatic the period of time you were there. Yeah, that's right. And uh, <coughs> our and I could not get to the embassy because we were leaving, and you know, I couldn't make any changes and so on. So I couldn't get to the embassy, and I didn't want to take and trust these books to anybody else. And my friend could not go to the embassy either, because he was Russian and Soviet citizen and so on. So uh, anyway, I distributed the books. We had I don't know how many suitcases and boxes and whatever. And, and hope for the best. And uh, for some reason, I don't understand, nothing was checked. Our baggage went through completely. So I had those two books. Did you ever encounter any problems when you were coming back and forth? Uh, or were there changes over time? Did it get better or no problem at all? Well, uh, the only problem I really ever had in the Soviet Union was that I was robbed three times. Uh, the first time it happened on a bus where somebody got my billfold out of my back pocket even though I wore uh, a, a trench coat. And uh, all they did was, or he did or she did, uh, was to take the paper money out of my billfold. Not the IDs or anything? No. Like uh, the second time, uh, I was robbed in the uh, Leningrad Circus. I'd taken a group of uh, American students from Purdue and IU uh, this was when we were in Hamburg, Germany for the year, and they wanted to go to the Soviet Union. So, uh, and I had suggested that to them. So we went over there. And uh, it was at Leningrad Circus, and I was confronted by two men, one behind me, one in front of me, and then two women. And the two women were uh, actually throwing their fists in my face, saying that I was, I was uh, uh, bothering uh, their children. And it dawned on me too late uh, that something wasn't right because no mother in her right mind in the Soviet sort of Union would leave her small children in that throng of people after you know, the, the Russians have a different kind of uh, uh, pattern for physical contacts and so on. So anyway, uh, I, uh, uh, I stood there and, and uh, I had no longer my, my billfold in the back pocket because uh, the policeman with whom I registered the, the loss the first time when it happened in Moscow, he had told me that the Russians had a saying, uh, 
he was saying that this pocket, that this pocket is already somebody else's pocket. And previously he had told me that in 17 years of service as a policeman in Moscow, it had never happened that there was any kind of a theft in a city of 8 million people. You know. And I told him, I said, I couldn't help it. I said, that's very interesting. He said, well, you say it never happens, but you have a saying, right? He looked at me. <laughs> Didn't know what to say. But anyway, so uh, uh, so I went back then and I uh, did a lot of research on Petrov and on that whole period. And uh, then when Gorbachev came to power, my research focus switched to uh, uh, Soviet domestic uh, politics and Soviet foreign policy. And my publishing went along those lines. And, uh, well. Where did you, uh, we were in Moscow most of the time. Did you rent an apartment there? Is that what? Uh, well, the could exchange, you come and go? At yes, okay. yes. Uh, there were no restrictions. We could come and go. Uh, we had a, an apartment uh, which by Soviet standards was very generous because we had our own uh, shower uh, in the apartment. We had our own uh, bathroom toilet uh, which was separate physically from uh, the rest of the bathroom uh, area. And uh, we had uh, two rooms. Uh, Typically, there were four to six and sometimes eight Russians who lived in the space that we had. Uh, so, you know, we were treated very generously and we didn't have to pay any kind of rent. Uh, actually, you might say that for the better part of one year, I was on the Soviet pay on this payroll of the Soviet Union because they paid for the room uh, uh, and uh, they also gave us a stipend. So we got... Uh, fairly good size amount of rubles every month. And uh, uh, and then uh, uh, there were other kinds of things that, you know, uh, basically the exchange worked very, very well. All right. Uh, Did your wife do anything special when she was over there? Uh, she uh, studied some Russian. Uh -huh. uh, she had Russian lessons, uh, lessons uh, with a woman who uh, was in the physics department. and. Uh, so, and then we did a lot of cultural uh, things. I mean, we were sometimes in the Bolshoi three times a week. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of folk music and a lot of theater. We saw My Fair Lady in Russian. In Moscow was a terrific performance, you know. So, uh, uh, yeah, and, and uh, uh, we just, uh, you know, explored. We did, did excursions uh, sometimes. And the, art, the art museum, the museums are nice. Yeah, too. the museums, oh, yes. of course. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there were things to do, and of course I had my work, but for Norma it was a different story. So she did a lot of reading, and uh, she wrote uh, uh, letters to her parents and her friends. Oh, and yeah. She's quite a letter writer anyway, and uh, you know she's just been going through uh, Christmas cards for about 140 people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's she's my kind of person. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Were you ever a fact fellow at all at Purdue? Faculty fellow, faculty fellow program. Uh, I don't know what. The fact fellow, you um, interact with the students in the residence halls. The fact, uh, President Humpty started that program. Oh yeah, in, yeah. Actually, I did this. Uh, I'm a with fact a fellow at Tarkington uh -huh. for a number yeah, of years. Yeah, I did. Uh, actually, I never was along with one group, but I had you know uh, requests from different uh, sure. sororities and, and uh, right. fraternities and so forth. Uh, so yeah, I had that kind of interaction, and that was very interesting. It's nice to interact with Yeah, yeah. And um, when was the last time that you were in Russia? Has it been recent? The last time I was in Russia, uh, where the third robbery took place, was uh, in uh, 1990. Uh, there was a conference in Moscow on religion and culture uh, in Russia, and I, uh, I wrote a paper, it was accepted. So I went to uh, Russia, uh, visit my parents in Germany as I always did on the way and uh, uh, then flew into Moscow on an air, air flight, uh, air flight fight, uh, flight in the evening. We landed about 10 o'clock uh, and I was the last person out of the airplane because I was sitting way in the back, I was going over my paper and making some preparations and so forth and, and uh, then uh, when I had my papers checked the uh, KGB official who did it uh, 
uh, let my visa disappear. And uh, then he asked me, he said, this is all in Russian. He said, you know, uh, uh, where's your visa? I said, well, it was my passport. Well, the Soviet visa was a little uh, bit, uh, <coughs> the visa stuck out of this, was, was bigger than the uh, passport, the American passport. And uh, uh, so I said, well, maybe it fell on the floor. It's still in Russian. He said, and he looked and said, no, it's not on the floor. And then he pushed a button. Out of nowhere came these two armed guys and said, you're not under arrest for being illegal in the territory of the USSR. Well, to make a long story short, what this all involved was a shakedown. They made me pay for another visa, uh, which was just like the visa I'd been issued by the Soviet Embassy in Washington, D.C. But uh, the problem was uh, that uh, uh, there was no picture. The Soviet visa issued in Washington, D.C. Uh, consisted of three parts. The entry part, then the middle part which had my picture on it, and then the exit. Which they, so when, when you left the Soviet Union, they took everything I had to do with the visa. Well, uh, and, and I said, well, I'm not illegal on the territory of the USSR, and I can prove it. So well, how are you going to prove it? I said, well, said I have a copy of the visa that your embassy issued me in, in uh, Washington, D.C. And I was sort of treading on, three, uh, on thin ice because you were, it was illegal to copy anything that had to do with the you know, official document. And he said, well, why did you have a visa? I said, well, I had to think of my feet real fast. I said, just as a souvenir. <laughs> so so uh, then they took me to... Uh, an absolute dump, which they called a hotel on the airport perimeter. The wife was uh, in with a huge you? bus. No, oh. I was up by myself. And uh, uh, and I stayed there overnight. I didn't sleep a wink. And the next morning, uh, I went back to uh, uh, the airport with the same two guys who had arrested me in this huge bus, all by myself. And uh, uh, and then uh, uh, I was met by a driver from the. Uh, conference and he took me to Moscow and gave my paper and I had the largest audience because I'm sure it's because uh, word had gotten around that this American worker had been arrested by the KGB <laughs> so everybody wanted to hear my paper or at least or see, see me it, yeah right? okay so uh, uh, and then I spent another week in uh, uh, another two weeks in Moscow uh, in an apartment that belonged to a Russian friend of mine who was uh, my, uh, my uh, assistant at Purdue for, for a year. He came in the early, uh, came in 1989, I guess, for a year. And uh, uh, the reason he came was because he wanted to work in my library on Petrov. He was writing a dissertation on Petrov as well. And uh, he had seen a copy of my dissertation uh, in uh, Microfish, which the University of Michigan published this. Uh, all dissertation and so on. So he knew that I had gotten into materials that uh, he hadn't seen yet, and uh, so he wanted to see you know, what I. He wrote a fellowship and he came and spent a year. And uh, uh, and it was uh, uh, the, at the time when uh, everything was uh, sort of beginning to be uh, well, was sort of a dis disassembling process in Moscow as I experienced it. Uh, Gorbachev was already in trouble. Uh, my friend was uh, well connected uh, with some of the Gorbachev people. I actually ended um, uh, uh, an interview with uh, Gorbachev's secretary, uh, who uh, uh, predicted that uh, uh, you know Gorbachev was uh, uh, was done politically and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Anyway. Uh, and then uh, I went back to the United States and I told my students over here uh, that uh, when I go to Moscow, down comes the Soviet Union because two weeks after I'd been there, the Soviet Union collapsed. And then the Soviet Union got <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so uh, uh, well, they just loved it, of course. So. <laughs> what were the libraries like that you were able to uh, The libraries in? were in, in uh, very, very good condition. Uh, I, I must... I mean, I was I was amazed. I mean, I worked in uh, libraries in Moscow, in Leningrad, in archives in Moscow, in archives in Leningrad, and uh, uh, 
I mean, it was really first wave, I would say. They hadn't really lost a lot of materials? Uh, uh, no. no. No, I don't think so. Uh, so they're able to keep them together yeah, pretty much yeah. okay, during the war. So. Yeah. The, uh, uh, <coughs> the people in the archive were a bit of strappers. I had a, I had a piece of paper, a letter actually, from the uh, Soviet Ministry of Higher Education. Higher and specialized education, that's what it was called, uh, had uh, requested that all of us who were in this exchange from the United States that we uh, make a list of the materials that we wanted. And then, of course, they okayed the materials, and if they didn't want to, they didn't know. And I had everything I wanted okay. I mean, I didn't have a list of the books that I wanted, but sure. the general areas and so forth. And uh, uh, I had uh, requested uh, uh, the uh, it's sort of like a dissertation that Kachov wrote at uh, uh, the University of St. Petersburg, uh, Petersburg University uh, in the 19th century. And I had located, I knew where it was. And I went there, and they told me, you need a special letter from Moscow you know, uh, to get to this material. So I went back to Moscow. And, uh, you went to Petersburg, and then you had to go yeah, back. Yeah, okay. and then I went uh, back uh, to Moscow, and I talked to the Ministry of uh, Higher Special Education, and then they said, no, you don't need a letter. You tell them that you don't need a letter. I said, well, I've already told them they didn't do anything. Well, I never did, did get to see that uh, uh, dissertation until my friend came, and he had the kinds of connections that allowed him to get uh, a copy, and so now I'm in possession of a copy of the dissertation. So that worked out even better. Yeah, that worked out very well. But I, I can have nothing but praise uh, uh, for the Russians and the way they took care of their books and their archives and so forth. They were very, very helpful. And I was even able to get the micro uh, microfilms uh, uh, done both at the Lenin Library and uh, Sadikov Shudin Library in, uh, in what was in Lenin, where I'm now St. Petersburg. Uh, so it was a very, very productive trip that I made. That's a big yeah. help, yeah. right? Uh, so you don't have like, too much, you know, interference yeah. to yeah, that's research. Right. Uh, but you know, the interesting thing was, uh, as I look at my library now, is is. Uh, do you ever is do a ca do you ever have you done a count? Do you have any idea how uh, many that? No, I, I, but I'm in the process of cataloging it, and I've done all, just about all the uh, uh, multi-volume. Uh, books like Tolstoy, uh, uh, Alexander Herzen, and uh, Chernyshevsky, I mean, all, you know, like 30 books, 25 books, 26 books, or whatever. Uh, those, those I have already. Uh, but now I'm involved in doing the uh, uh, individual volumes, and there are, I don't know how many, that's going to take a long time to type the title and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's what I'm doing. But some of the books, you know, have like a real history, you know, kind of special. Like, I have a volume of uh, Nikolai Gogol's uh, 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 famous book <coughs> called uh, uh, I'm "Drawing a Blank." Here, uh, you can insert it after. That's okay. But it has a special thing inside it. Well, it's a it's a large uh, volume. It's about uh, this high. But you know, five five inches high, s seven inches or eight inches wide, and maybe twelve inches. Uh, oh, wow. It's called Dead Souls. Uh, in uh, uh, Russian, and uh, <coughs> that volume I saw in the bookstore in in, uh, in Moscow, and it has artwork between every page. That's why it's so thick, and it's got you know very fancy kind of uh, beginning letters and so it's a piece of art. And uh, that book was 15 rubles, which in those days was less, when I was there and bought it, was less than $15. So I bought it, and since it was so heavy, it took up a lot of space, uh, and since I would legally export it, this was uh, published in 1905, I think. And at that time, it was still export this. I had to pay a uh, hundred percent uh, tax on it, so it would cost me the rubles of which I had plenty anyway, and then fifteen dollars. I went to the post office, and uh, the woman uh, who took care of me uh, uh, 
told me that I couldn't send that book. I this said, is why in not? Moscow, you're going to send it? In Moscow, at the post office. And I said, why not? She said, it's too big. The post, you know, uh, <laughs> the po uh, postal service can send only books, uh, packages of books that are, you know. So this was too big. And so I was kind of, you know, uh, well, I would have taken it to the embassy. Uh, but I just said to her, so what can I do? I said, you want me to cut your Google in half? To fit it in your and she said new Ladner. She said okay, and she sent it. You know. It's one of my prized possessions. You know. and, the right. Yeah, and another another book I'll never forget was I met one of my friends uh, who had connections to the bookstore, to the bookstores that I couldn't go into, and actually I did go into the uh, uh, writers' union bookstore one time, and I made it to the second floor where all the good things were started looking around and so on, and then all of a sudden somebody said, where's your purpose? And, and then they said, who are you? I said, well, I'm, I'm a special student from America. <laughs> so they had been, you know, much Could you not go in if one of, the, uh, one of the writers, could you not accompany him in the bookstore or not? Uh, I'm not sure. Oh. I never had uh, any... any uh, like you, a husband and wife or a friend? Either. Yeah, oh. no, I never really had any close connection with anybody belong to the Soviet Writers Union. Most of those people uh, were always walking on thin ice because they had to toe the line, otherwise you know, that was the end of their publishing and stuff. Of course, they didn't want to do that. But uh, anyway, I met this friend in downtown Moscow, and uh, he gave me a book, and I, he had it wrapped, and I looked, and I said, I said to him, I said, well, well, why do you give me Pushkin? Because Pushkin is one of those authors who was massively published in the Soviet Union. And he said, uh, he knew a little English, he said, what do you say about covers and uh, books in English? And then I opened the book and I knew what he meant. He said, oh, he said, don't judge a book by its cover. And what they had done is they had, they had created a, a different kind of uh, cover for the book. And that said Pushkin, you know, such an Indian, like Pushkin's works. <laughs> And uh, then inside was uh, a collection of writings by Nikolai Gohan, who was executed by Stalin. Uh, and you know, was one of the really promising politicians be before the Stalin era had really began. Uh, uh, I mean, he was a communist, but a very different communist than Stalin was. So there are those kinds of uh, experiences that I had uh, uh, that you know, really... Uh, uh, Enrich your life. Yeah, uh, and that's why I, to some extent, I find it, well, not to some extent, I find it very difficult to even contemplate that one of these days these books will no longer be within easy reach. You know. So uh, they're like children to me in a sense. You know, they have a history, they've been with me all these years. And I can't say that I've read every book cover to cover, but I was in a position to do my research virtually at home all the time, sure. which made it a lot, lot more expen I mean, inexpensive and also effective. Uh, right. So, uh, uh, what about now that you retire? What have you been doing since you retired? It's post retirement. Well, I think? have. Uh, I mean, I'm still reading things on Russia and so on uh, as they you know hit the press and so on and so forth. But I've not really done any new research on Russia. Uh, I have some things that are partly finished, which I may finish, uh, but I've really become interested in something completely different. And that is, uh, I'm interested in uh, the history of the Bible, uh, in uh, the history of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And so I now have a new library. I mean, it's not nearly as big as the Russian library, but I have quite a You have collection. to build on your house pretty soon. Uh, yeah, uh, well actually, I do that kind of reading mostly when, when, we, when we're in Florida. I have a study there, and, and those books are mostly there. So uh, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to discover is you know, what commonalities do we have with these other faiths, since they're all based on books, you know, whether it's the Quran or whether it's the Bible or whether it's uh, you know, uh, the Hebrew Bible and so on. So uh, I'm trying to educate myself on, uh, on, on good. that. And I'm trying to find out you know, what we have in common and what divides us. Sure. Each of these faiths is really much too exclusive 
in their present configuration, and that's why we have so much trouble getting along with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there is a thread, there are some threads. Yeah, well, you know, Abraham is a, a common figure for Jews and for, right. <laughs> for Gentiles, like uh, Christians, and also, of course, for, uh, right. for the uh, uh, Muslims. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, um, you're going to tell us about an outstanding event or an, and or a Purdue tradition or both? Well, both, I suppose. Good. An outstanding event uh, in my life, uh, I suppose, the very time I was when we were able to adopt our two children. Uh, but there are some other things. Uh, Like, for example, uh, as I look back, I've just been so singularly fortunate in getting financial support to allow me to do what I wanted to do. And uh, uh, I think there, you know, at least is an element of luck. I worked very hard, and I had you know, ex excellent grades and so on and so forth, but still, uh, there were a lot of students I met at IU who I think were every bit as good as I was, I had the potential. They weren't as lucky in getting grants as I was. I was in the position when I was at IU to actually decline grants. Like when I wrote my dissertation, the Ford Foundation uh, gave me a special grant to do my dissertation. And uh, uh, it was a five month grant, uh, and uh, uh, IU had, had a, a, a whole year, but much less money. Uh, so I turned that one down. I turned down a, a bank uh, from the University of uh, California, Berkeley, and some others. I forgot now. I mean, I I applied, and sometimes I didn't, you know, sure. uh, didn't uh, uh, get get a. Uh, but you know, some things like, for example, one grant I got, I wrote out on the back side of an airplane ticket going back from Europe to the United States. And then it's typed it up and sent it in, and lo and behold, and this was a very, very good grant for uh, work in Europe uh, for, uh, let's see, the summer and uh, uh, the spring sem the spring semester and so on. So, very good. Yeah. So I was, I was fortunate. I worked with some good people, and I had you know, very good recommendations from people who were highly regarded in the that always helps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I just have had some experiences that have nothing to do with academia and so on. Uh, uh, we made a trip, we, my wife and I, and a couple we met in Germany, good friends of ours, made a trip in the Canadian uh, Rockies, and that was just awesome to me. Uh, I could do that again any time. <laughs> I say that is quite yeah, nice. Yeah, it is really. Well, of course, the American Rockies, too, they've been several times, but Sure. The is fact the fact that I was able to do so much traveling that had to do with my work. I mean, uh, I made about a dozen trips to the Soviet Union, and I always had my way paid, and that meant I could you know, fly to Amsterdam, rent a car, drive to my parents' house in Germany, spend a week or however much time, and then do the same thing on the way back. You know. <laughs> Great. Just worked out nicely. So, yeah, it worked really yeah. very well. Mm -hmm. uh, As you look back, any closing comments you'd like to share with your researchers that you think of? Well, I, I should uh, I should mention that uh, uh, my f my second book actually my second book, which was a clear about the Lenin, was written here, was finished. I had begun writing it. It was finished at uh, Purdue, and it was finished in a rather short time because uh, Myron Hale. The uh, then chairman of, of the political science department, the new political science department, just had been created, uh, gave me a reduced teaching load. Uh, and uh, I worked uh, all day at Purdue. I had part of my library here, part of the library there. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, I uh, <coughs> was able to get it published. And uh, it was published uh, in the United States by Lippincott, first edition, and then uh, Princeton University picked it up, and uh, the publisher in England picked it up. So there were like four different editions of that book. 
And uh, not too many weeks ago, I still got a, a, a royalty check. wasn't a whole lot, but <laughs> so it's still selling somewhere. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. So uh, uh, and and then uh, uh, I think uh, the move to Purdue was was you know, very good for me because I went from a trimester system to a, a semester system. I had a lot more time for research and. Uh, there was, and, and I have acknowledged this in the, uh, in the, in the book on Lenin, there were, there were some people in the uh, uh, department at the, at the university uh, here at the library, in the Hissey Library, who uh, uh, searched for books that were not at Purdue, the exchange you know, that we have, and so on. And they were just great. I mean, I, I don't know what I would have done without them, because in those days I couldn't just pick up and go to California and go to Harvard or wherever. So, uh, you know, I owe them a great debt of, adi- uh, <coughs> of gratitude because uh, I was so dependent on very elusive kinds of resources that, uh, you know, were scattered all over, the, uh, all over the globe. Nobody believes me that I didn't know when I chose my dissertation topic that it was really thanks to that dissertation topic that I would be able to travel all over Europe <laughs> in the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, uh, and within the United States. You never States know how things are, where they're going to end up. No, turn that's, out, that's really Which is okay. So, uh, uh, anyway, I mean, Purdue has been uh, 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 very good, and I have a number of, uh, I got a number of grants that helped me with my research, and uh, those were very helpful because it sometimes freed me from teaching completely in mm-hmm. semester. Uh, and I don't know, you know, how you do this, but uh, there's some data here. You're welcome to That's good. take those and. Uh, we want to thank you, Professor Dean. This has been very, very helpful, and we really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, the uh, the other thing that I'm grateful for was uh, the students. Uh, I had some really first-rate students, both at Iowa State and and here. Uh, the one that I had at Iowa State, uh, who probably had the most influence in his later life, was a, a student who uh, was in the ROTC uh, program at Iowa State. And uh, when he was finished at Iowa State, where I taught him, uh, he went to uh, uh, the Air Force Intelligence School in uh, Colorado. And from there, went to Korea, became the briefing officer for the American general, commanding general uh, in Korea, and uh, then he went to IU and finished his degree. Actually, he started his degree, made a, did a mass at IU, and then went f- uh, to American University in Washington and finished his PhD there. And uh, he became the brief, uh, he worked in the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and he became the briefing officer for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And when he was in Washington, D.C., I was forever invited to come there for seminars and so on and so forth. I ended up, uh, this was not really because of uh, his position, but because of a paper I'd given at, uh, at, at a conference in Chicago. Uh, I ended teaching a seminar at the, uh, uh, at the uh, Central Intelligence Agency twice a year for the newcomers who came in. Uh, and that was very interesting because I made connections there and I got materials through the CIA that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else either. So I was, <laughs> was a winner. Everything that helps. Yeah. Uh, and then I had some students here at, I, at, uh, at Purdue, uh, particularly in the, uh, in the uh, graduate program and PhD program, all of whom have now uh, tenured positions at various universities and colleges in the United States, which I'm glad about. But I had some students that I'll remember for a very different reason. I had in particular a girl who, after I'd returned the first exam in a course on Soviet politics, a senior level course, and she came to me and she said, Professor Thien, I think you made a mistake on my grade. And I said, well, let me look at it. I said, it wouldn't be the first time that I made a mistake. I try not to, but she said, she said you gave me too many points. And sure enough, as I looked at it and I did the addition, I'd given her too many points, and the difference was one grade. Instead of an A, she was supposed to get a B for that score. And uh, at that at that point in time, you know, I was 
I had, I think, two other cases where students came to me and they said, you know, you've given me too many points. So in a career spanning from 1960, uh, from 19, what was it, 1964 to uh, 2003, I had three students, you know, who, who gave me their papers back and said, you know, you need to correct this because it's too many points. Uh, it was usually the otherwise. They came and then, you know, they complained, oh, why didn't I get more points on this essay, et cetera, and so on. But anyway, she came, and uh, <coughs> I said to myself, now, this is really remarkable. And, uh, you know, the university had all kinds of programs, I mean, all kinds of policies in place for punishing students who were caught plagiarizing and so on and so forth. And I had, you know, quite a few of those as well. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, but we had nothing to really reward students who had that kind of integrity. And uh, so I did a number of things. First of all, I wrote a letter to the department head, and I wrote a letter to the dean, and then I wrote a letter to her parents. And uh, the letter essentially, I mean, described what happened, and I told the parents that uh, whatever you did to raise this girl of yours, this girl of yours, you must have done a good job. <laughs> And then my wife and I invited her for dinner on Sunday. And uh, uh, she was really incredible. She just bubbled about her family and her studies and so on and so forth. And uh, I mean, sometimes professors influence students, but sometimes students are unforgettable for a professor. She was one of those. And uh, then there was another one. She was a different case. She was an Afro-American student whom I had an introductory level course, uh, sophomore level course. And uh, uh, one of their tasks was to write an essay uh, on a, a topic of their choice, uh, but the topics they would have to bring to me for me to improve the topics. So she came and she said, I'd like to write a, uh, a paper on Martin Luther King. I said, well, that makes good sense. Go ahead. Uh, one of my policies uh, in starting a course was to have the students do some writing, handwriting, and the reason for that was that I wanted to get a copy of the handwriting in case I ever had doubts when they handwrote papers, whether they were actually the, the writers. And uh, uh, anyway, so, uh, so I knew from her writing uh, something about, you know, the syntax and uh, what some of the problems were grammatically and so on and so forth, and also in her handwriting. Well, the paper that she wrote was typed, but after I read it, uh, half a page, I knew that she could not have possibly written this herself. I went back to you know, my file. So I called her in, and uh, I, I uh, well, first before I called her in, I went in the net, and within five minutes, I had, I had the article from which she had plagiarized, verbatim, you know, I mean, it was a very, very uh, uh, crass case of uh, plagiarism. Uh, but some, I'm a, somehow you know, it struck me that you know, this girl, if I would have reported her to the dean's office, she could have been kicked out of the university, but I would have been. And I told her, I said, you know, you've done something that's terribly wrong, uh, but I'm going to give you a second chance. I said, read her this paper, and I went over her, what she needed to do to give credit to author and so on and so forth. And, uh, and she did write that paper, and it was her work. Uh, she got a B in it, and uh, uh, then several years later, when she was a senior, she turned up in a senior level course for political science majors only that I taught. And I can tell you, can't tell you how different that girl was, how she had developed. I mean, the first thing was dress. She was impeccably dressed. She was impeccably well prepared every time that we I had them present topics and so on and so forth. And then when she did her final presentation on the paper that she wrote, she had uh, uh, electronic equipment that she had mastered and so forth. I mean, she had a, she was certainly maybe the best or one of the best students. And then some years later, I met her here at the university and she's now working with her career. And uh, so, I think I did the right thing. <laughs> you did. I agree. That's very nice. Thank you very much. <clears throat>